It's Kate, and this is the second video for week three of Math 23. Now, before we get to another application of the row reduction algorithm, we need to beef up our vocabulary a little bit. There are a ton of important terms here. Everything that's bold in this section is bold-faced for a reason, so please make sure to think about these terms, commit them to memory, but more importantly, have them be flexible notions in your mind that you're able to apply to a variety of different situations. First, we begin with a set of some number of elements. This is how we use set notation. We use the curly brackets on either side. And A1, A2, A3, A4 are our four elements. The term linear combination is used to refer to any arbitrary sum of scalar multiples of those elements. So here's an example of a linear combination right here. a1 minus 2a2 plus 4a3 minus 5a4, that's a linear combination. 2a2 plus a3 is a linear combination. a4 minus a1 is a linear combination. So keep in mind that at its most basic level, that's what a linear combination is. Now, let's get more specific about our set. When we're talking about a set of vectors, which is what we care about in this particular unit in linear algebra, we have a set of vectors. We describe this set of vectors as linearly independent if none of the vectors can be written as a linear combination of the others. So I wouldn't be able to write something like this that a3 is equal to a1 plus 2a2. So to say that a set is linearly independent means that I can't write any of the vectors in the set in terms of the other vectors, as linear combination of the other vectors. On the other hand, if I can do this, if I can write one or more of the vectors as a linear combination of the other vectors, then we say that the set is linearly dependent. Now, a note about semantics here. I get this question every year. One is that these adjectives, linearly independent, linearly dependent, they can describe set, a set as a whole. And in that case, if a set is linearly independent, that means none of the vectors can be written in terms of each other. And if a set is linearly dependent, it only takes one vector in the set, one element that's able to be written as a linear combination of the others to make the whole set linearly dependent. It's like an all or nothing thing. Either every single one is linearly independent, in which case the set is considered linearly independent, and if even one can be written as linear combination, then the set is considered linearly dependent. You can also say that a particular vector is linearly independent of the others. So when I say A3, vector A3 is linearly independent of the others, it means A3 can't be written as a linear combination of the other vectors. So even if I had a set that was linearly dependent, there may be a particular vector in that set that is linearly independent from the other vectors in the set. So it's a, a question of semantics. When we're talking about this vector is linearly dependent on the other vectors, that means it can be written in terms of the other vectors. When we say a vector is linearly independent, it means it cannot be written in terms of the other vectors. When we say that a set is linearly independent, it means that none of the vectors can be written in terms of the other vectors. And when we say a set is linearly dependent, it means that at least one of the vectors in the set can be written in terms of the others. So something to think about there. All right, our next big term right now is subspace. So we have a subspace is a set of vectors, and we have a note here that it's usually an infinite number of vectors. But it's a set of vectors that is closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Well, what does that mean? Well, closed means that if I take two vectors, any two vectors, in the set and add them together, their sum is also in the set. And also if it's closed under scalar multiplication, that means if I take any vector in the set 
and take a scalar multiple of it, any scalar multiple of it, then that scalar multiple is also in the set. What is an example of a subspace is probably what you're thinking right now. Well, we're, we are told here that a subspace of Fn is the set of all possible linear combinations of some set of vectors. So if you take two vectors and just think about all their possible linear combinations, that's a subspace. What's an example of that? What about the plane, right, R2? We could take two vectors. We could take E1 and E2, the two standard basis vectors. And the set of all possible linear combinations of those two vectors is the entire two-dimensional plane in R2. Of course, you could also think of it like this. Look at this little red vector. Let's think about the subspace that all linear combinations of this little red vector create. All the scalar multiples of this little red vector. And that's pretty much the same thing as adding, taking linear combinations of the little red vector by itself. But when you think about the set of all of the scalar multiples of this little red vector, that ends up being this blue line that extends in both directions forever. And so that blue line is an example of a subspace. Adding even more to our vocabulary, we say that a set is said to span or to generate the subspace. And span can be used as both a noun and as a verb. We can say that a set spans a subspace. And then when we talk about the span of a set of vectors, we're talking about the subspace. So it can be a noun or a verb. And you'll get more and more used to using that appropriately, depending on the context of the statement that you're making. As you go through these sample problems and you listen to the language and lecture and you're working on your homework and the small group problems, but you'll get used to that. So both a noun and a verb. You can say the vectors span, or you can talk about the span of the vectors being the set of all linear combinations of those vectors. So as a result of the definition, a subspace has the following properties. First of all, the zero vector is always in the subspace because we're saying all scalar multiples and it's closed under scalar multiplication. So all scalar multiples are included in the set. And of course, there's the zero scalar multiple and that will return the zero vector. So the zero vector has to be in a subspace. And of course, this is just these number two and number three are the straight definitions of a subspace that we discussed up here, that it's closed under addition, that it, for any two elements that are in the subspace, their sum is also in the subspace. And for any element in the subspace and any scalar in the field F, the scalar multiple is also in the subspace. So these three things, these two are straight from the definition and this is the special case where this scalar is zero. Now perhaps the most important definition of this unit is coming up. So make sure you really take your time learning this. A basis of a vector space or subspace is a linearly independent set that spans that space. There's a lot to unpack there. So a basis of a vector space or subspace is a linearly independent set. So that means that none of the elements in the set can be written as a linear combination of the other elements. And that set spans the space. So the linear combinations of the elements in that set, all of them, cover the entire space. So that's what a basis of a vector space is. It's a set of elements such that all the linear combinations of that set create all of the elements in that space. And the elements in that set are linearly independent from each other. That's what a basis means. Now, the definition of a basis can be stated in three different ways. Uh, each of these definitions imply the other two. So the first one says that it's a maximal set of linearly independent vectors in V. So that means that if you add any other vector in the vector space, it will no longer be linearly independent. This is the most number of linearly independent vectors you can possibly have in the vector space. The second definition is that it is a minimal spanning set. It spans V, and if you take one away, 
it'll stop being able to sp span the vector space V. So that means that this is the fewest number of vectors you can possibly have that still span the space. And the third definition is that it is a set of linearly independent vectors that spans V. So we're going to work on how to prove that each of these definitions imply the other two. Uh, there will be a couple in the sample problems and in the small group problems and, uh, and on your homework. Very useful proof style that we'll be talking about. Okay, so another important thing, a term that's probably been tossed around a bunch already, at least in your head as you're thinking about some of these vectors, is that the number of elements in a basis for a given vector space is called the dimension of the vector space. For instance, the standard basis vectors, E1 and E2, like this, provide a basis for R2. I can't add another vector and have it not in that space in R2 and have it not be a linear combination of these two vectors. I also can't take one away and still be able to make all the vectors in R2 using just one of these uh, elements and it's a linearly independent set. And so when we have something like a basis, here's my standard basis in R2, the number of elements, in this case, in this set, I have two elements, one zero and zero one. And so that's the dimension of the vector space it spans. So that's why R2 is two dimensional. It's not just that it's made of two components, of course, that's part of it, but really the dimension is the number of elements in a basis that spans the space. And we're going to talk about this later and how to prove it, but uh, no matter what basis you're using, the dimension is well defined. You will always find, you can have many different bases that span the same space. They will always have the same number of elements. So how does row reduction fit into this? Well, say you're given a bunch of vectors and you want to know whether they are a linearly independent set. Here's an example. Here are five vectors, v1, v2, v3, and w1 and w2. And for the most part, I can't figure out which ones are linearly independent from the others by inspection. By inspection is fancy math talk for just by looking at it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a matrix whose columns are the vectors in this set. This will be the first column, this will be the second, this will be the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Okay, write down that matrix. Okay, here's the matrix. Now, let's row reduce it. So here's the matrix post row reduction. While it's really easy to figure out which column corresponds to which vector over here, because this is v1, this is v2, this is v3, this is w1, this is w2, it's much more difficult after row reduction. So I took the liberty of writing down the vectors that uh, these columns correspond to. So the first thing is, is that any column that has a pivotal 1 in it means that that vector is linearly independent from the vectors listed to its left. So that means v1, linearly independent. v2, linearly independent of v1. Ah, here, v3 does not have a pivotal 1 in that column. When it, you reach a column that does not have a pivotal 1, it means that that vector, v3, can be written as a linear combination of the, ve of the vectors to its left. And in fact, these are the coefficients for those two columns that do have pivotal ones. 3 times v1 plus 5 times v2 will give you v3. And here w1, again, we do not have a pivotal one in that column, so it means that w1 can be written as a linear combination of the pivotal one column vectors to its left. And so that means w1 can be written as 2 times v1 plus 1 times v2. And last, we arrive at W2. W2's column has a pivotal 1 in it, which means that it cannot be written as a linear combination of the ones to its left. It is linearly independent of the vectors that have gone before it. So what kinds of questions are asked where you would use this type of 
skill. Well, a lot of them. One in particular would be one like, here's a set of vectors, v1, v2, v3, w1, w2. Are w1 and w2 in the span of v1, v2, and v3? That means, first of all, what does that question mean? That means that can w1 be written as a linear combination of v1, v2, and v3? Can w2 be written as a linear combination of v1, v2, and v3? So what would you do? You would create this matrix where each of the columns are one of these vectors. You just stick them all together and create the matrix, row reduce it. And then you take a look at the columns that correspond to W1 and W2. When you ask, are W1 and W2 in the span of V1, V2, V3, that means you should probably be listing V1, V2, and V3 in the first three columns, and then the ones where you're asking, are they in the span of these three columns after that? So when you zoom in here and it does not have a pivotal one here, you know it can be written as a linear combination of the vectors that come before it to the left. So the answer is yes, W1 is in the span of V1, V2, and V3. When you look at W2 and you see that pivotal one, that means that it's linearly independent of the vectors to its left. And so the answer would be no, W2 is not in the span of V1, V2, and V3. You'll get a lot more practice with this in all the problems to come, but it's an excellent application of row reduction.